This is a, a series at the moment which is talking about our heart. It's called All Heart for All People. And we talked about uh, how we can be the kind of people that live all hearted for the others in our world, those who are serving Jesus even overseas. Um, we had our missionary friends a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Kelvin, our pastors, Pastor Kelvin and Rebecca Windsor from Vietnam. They served there with their two children. They've been there. How many years did we work out they'd been in Vietnam for? As long as they've been married, pretty much. And they, um, they've been serving over there. And then we've got next week, which I encourage you to be in the room next week. And if you're watching online or listening to this later, be in the room next week. It's the 12th, it'll be the 12th of March. And it is our uh, special service with our other missionary family that we support, Paul and Deb Hilton. And they'll be here in the room and we'll be able to hear from them about all the work that they are doing overseas. They're more than, they pioneered the work in Vietnam that Kelvin and Rebecca are now carrying on, but they now work across the globe in other countries mentoring other missionaries. And so they've got a vast and wide uh, amount of experience for us to hear from. So it's going to be a lot of fun next week. So I would encourage you to be in the room for that. So this is an all heart for all people and those kinds of missionaries who are overseas doing amazing things in other countries, it is, I feel like, I don't know if you feel the same way as me, but it's very easy to be all hearted and love people who are going into the world overseas, giving up their lives and livelihood in Australia, not their, li- not their lives, their livelihood in Australia and sacrificing on the mission field. And, you know, in developing countries, they're sowing their lives into that. I find it easy to love them, encourage them, financially support them. But there are other people that are harder to love. Sometimes they're people a little closer to home. The ones who, you know the ones, they're just rude. (laughs) Because the the missionaries aren't rude. We love you guys. They're not obnoxious like your friends are. They're easy to love. They're not like the loud next door neighbour who owns the the six dogs. They're not like them, that's right, or just the loud next-door neighbour who lives on their own who's louder than all the other and neighbours with all the animals. You know, that person has their TV on a thousand. It's like, surely you can hear that from here. I can hear it from here. And all the difficult work, mate, the difficult colleague that you have to endure your days with, and you don't get to choose that, you have to be there. Or the barista who gets your order wrong when you order a long flat, Long flat? Flat white, long black. What do you get? A flat white, half strength mochaccino <laughs> with a sweetener, half sugar, half chocolate, half mocha. <laughs> Quarter strength. <laughs> oh, I don't understand what these people... And they get it wrong. Well, it's no wonder. Listen to your order. You guys are out of control. Those people are harder to love than the missionaries, aren't they? And But this, is, this really is, this series, we're trying to... Uh, press on our hearts a little bit and and encourage us to be the kind of people that are willing to love all-hearted and support all-hearted all people, even the hard-to-love people. And so the title of this message this morning is, No, really, all people. How to love the unlovable. And you're thinking, well, just turn to your neighbour and say, he's not talking about you. Just let them know he's not talking about you. That's right, just turn to the person behind you. Just interrupt them while they're scanning the QR code and just say, he's not talking about you. You are lovely. Just let them know how lovely they are. You are lovely. You are so beautiful. You're wonderful. I'm so pleased you're sitting next to me. I hate to be the person on the other side. (laughs) So I wonder if we we know how, how loving we are. I wonder if we were able to do a test. I wonder if you did an online test. I did an online test this week. I was researching this for this message, actually, and I, was, I stumbled across an online test about measuring your social awareness. Can you, can you measure or can you observe social cues? And it showed you uh, 36 pictures of people's eyes that had different emotions, and they listed down a range of emotions. You had to choose which emotion. And out of 36, I'm going to brag a little bit, I got 30 right. So there's, there's an emotion, the six, there must be six different, or, or a, an emotion I just miss. So if you always feel like I'm not watching or looking at you properly, you must be the, that emotion that I don't understand. So, so we're going to do a test now, and the Bible presents us with this great test to see uh, how it is that we can, we can really prove that we are the kind of loving people that we're called to be, and as the Bible teaches us to be, how we could measure that, how we could be all-hearted for all people. Are we following the leading of Jesus? Are we being like him when we follow his lead 
on how to love other people. So let's look at John chapter 13, and verse 34. It says this. This is the litmus test of love. It says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Everybody say, new commandment. That's right. You would think the guys would have worked it out. But no, Jesus said, this is brand new, hot off the press. He says this, love each other. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. He then says, you love your love for one another. Look what it says here. Your love for one another, or each other, will prove, that's, that's, the, that's the test. This is what will prove that you are a disciple. It will prove that you are my disciples if you love one another. So if you want to test to see whether or not you're heading in the right direction, loving like Jesus would love, which is to love everyone and give our lives over for them, then we simply have to ask the question, how much do I love other people, even the unlovable? Because that will prove whether or not I'm following just like Jesus and loving others like him. And you know, not only do Jesus' followers love each other, they have a special place in their heart just like Jesus for the unlovable. So let's, let's just press on this challenge a little deeper before we talk about how we can be the kind of people that love others well. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to 47. Jesus again, this is the Sermon on the Mount, arguably the most profound teaching that was ever brought to the world in the history of the world. Today, our civilization at least is built upon the tenets that Jesus preached in Matthew chapter 5. And he says this in verse 43. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Oh, wow. That sounds even harder than loving the unlovable. Love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. Come on, that's a, that's a word, isn't it? When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the, I love this, respond with the supple moves of prayer. How good is that? When someone gives you a hard time, anyone in the room this morning had a hard time from someone of those unlovable, difficult people this week? Come on, put your hand in the air. It's, if, unless it's the person next to you, then just keep your hand down. <laughs> Put it in the chat online. You can make it anonymous that way, maybe. And so respond with prayer. For then you are working out of your true selves, your God-created selves. It goes on to say, verse 46 and 7, it says, If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? You know, some people are like, hey, I'm kind, I'm nice. I, I, anyone that walks down the street, you know, some people say this to me, they say, look, What's happened to the world? Whenever I walk down the street, nobody says hello to me. I'm like, okay, well, who do you say hello to? <laughs> oh, good question. Okay, let's keep moving. <laughs> if you say hello to people who walk down the street, okay, in a word, what I'm saying is, this is, this, is, this, is, this is Jesus, he says, in a word, what I'm saying is this, on the screen, grow up. You know what? Jesus is saying that to you today. I'm not saying that to you. It's Jesus. He's saying, guys, grow up. Online, don't shoot out. Grow up. <laughs> listening back to this later, don't fast forward. <laughs> Just in case you're listening in 1.5 times or two. Grow up, Jesus says. You are kingdom subjects. In other words, Jesus is saying there's a different way that you should be living. You don't live like the rest of the world lives. There's a standard that you are going to live by now, and it is a higher standard. It's a kingdom standard. He says, live like the kingdom. Carry the culture of the kingdom. Live out your God-created identity because it looks different to the way that the rest of the world treats each other. He says, live generously and graciously toward others the way God lives toward you. You should stand out. You should be different. You should be peculiar. There should be something about you that marks you as a person of love as opposed to other people in your family, in your workplace, in your business, in your school. You are are a person that carries a kingdom culture which is of a higher standard and you live by a higher expectation. You don't have to lower yourself to the cultural norms and low expectations of the world around you. You can stand up, rise up and live above it because you carry the kingdom culture in your heart because you are an all-hearted person that loves others, even unlovable people. Unlovable people. So we've established that there are some people in our lives that are hard to love. We have some enemies in our world. However, in accepting the fact that some people are hard to love, unfortunately, you must also accept that it is very, very likely that for many people, 
you are the unlovable one. I, we just, I mean, let me just say that again in case you were dozing off and accepting the fact that there are some people who are hard to love. Unfortunately, you must accept that it is very, very likely that for many people in your world, guess what? You are the unlovable one. So this message really could have been entitled this, how to love the unlovable and how to be more lovable. Yeah, that's great. We can get on board with that. Yeah, yeah. Or how to love the unlovable and how to stop being a terrible human. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's great. I can can just see the YouTube views skyrocketing now. What about this one? Stop. (laughs) How to love the unlovable and how to wake up and realise that you're not so lovable after all. So this message really answers those two questions. How can I love the unlovable? And how can I be easier to love? And that's what we're going to talk about just for the next few minutes. How can I love the unlovable? And how can I be easier to love? So first, let's address the first question. How do I love the unlovable? Number one, we say yes to Jesus' love for us. See, we cannot truly love others without Jesus. And this is true in 1 John 4, verse 9 to 12. It says this, it says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Look at that on the screen. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, Since God loved us that much, since God loved you that much, we surely ought to love each other. You see, you can't love others unless you receive the love of Jesus for yourself. God loved us that much. Surely we ought to love each other the same. He says, no one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression. You know, this is the other powerful moment here in this text is that God wants to be revealed. How? Through your love for others. If people aren't seeing God in our world, it's because we have given up loving other people. So for those of us who have received Jesus, it's a challenge to reflect the love that we've been shown by our Saviour Jesus, that he would come and die for us in our place for our misdeeds and our brokenness and our sin and our mistakes. And we say, we are so grateful for your grace, Jesus. We are going to extend that to everyone in my world, even the people who I find difficult to love. And for those of who are yet to receive Jesus in this room or online or listening later, for those who are yet to know what it is to have that free gift of salvation real in their life, I'm going to invite you in a moment to receive that for the first time. And it's going to shift the way you think about everything, like putting on a brand new set of glasses and seeing the world in a whole new way. And all of a sudden, most of those unlovable people you'll see can be loved because of what Jesus has done in you. So let's, first of all, receive that love that Jesus has for us. That's how we can love others. Secondly, how we love others is this. It's number two. This is part of my research I was doing this week because I'm not very good at this particular point. But I know that's why I've written, that's why I've entitled it this way. Grow in empathy. Grow in empathy. You know, it's hard to just say to someone, you just need to be more empathetic because it's difficult. Trust me, I know. It's something that we can grow in it. And I wanted to give you some really practical things about how we can grow in empathy and what the difference is between being empathetic and having sympathy or sympathetic. You ready for these? So empathy says that I'm going to do whatever I can to feel what you are feeling, even though I've never felt it before. I'm going to do everything I can to feel what you're feeling, even though I've never felt it before. Sympathy says that I'm sad because you're sad. But sympathy doesn't step into the shoes of your suffering with you. You see, sympathy just says, I'm sad because you're sad. But it doesn't say, I'm going to step into your shoes of suffering with you. You see, sympathy sends a card. Empathy shows up at the door. Sympathy sends a card, but empathy turns up at your door. And so how do we grow in empathy? Well, these are some practical things that we can do. And again, this is coming from experience of someone who's had to grow in empathy. Number one is that we can spend time with broken people. 
I wonder how much of your life you spend with the people you know, you like, you're comfortable with, the people who are in your workplace, in your sphere of influence, your social circles. I wonder how much time we spend with broken people. You know, one of the great things about church is that we intentionally put ourselves into an environment where we may not know who we're going to be sitting next to. And that's great. That's good. And up beyond church, we say that nobody sits alone because we intentionally sometimes want to try to put people together who might not necessarily sit next to each other. Because it's not about you. <laughs> it's about you growing in empathy so you can show the love of God to other people, even those who are unlovable, even those who are difficult, and even those who might just be your enemy. Come on, church is a great, is a great leveller. It's a great place for you to grow in empathy because you spend time with people who are not like you. And we can learn about the lives of others. Another thing that we can do to grow in empathy, do the work to learn about the lives of others. You could do that by spending time with new people, walking up to someone at a party you've never spoken to before and saying hello, hearing their story, what do you do, where do you come from, what was that like, tell me more about that. You could do that if you're not necessarily out and about or a social person, you could read some books. I know, it's a revelation. Reading novels, stories of other people's lives that have experiences other than yours who are from other countries with other worldviews helps you understand that your world is bigger than just the one that you exist in day in and day out. There's a big world out there and lots of experiences of lots of people's lives. So come on, if we want to be the kind of people that love others and have grace for others, we do have to broaden our life experience. Reading helps us do that or travelling helps us do that. You could go to another place, sure, maybe not even overseas. You could drive over the hill here in from Cessnock, the uh, border between Cessnock and the rest of the world. It's called Neath Hill. You could drive over the border and you could explore the world, visit Maitland and Newcastle and maybe even Sydney one day. You know, you could get someone to take you there or catch the bus or the train. <laughs> Read books, travel, broaden your mind. Big lives have room for difficult people. Small lives have no room for complexity. So come on, big people live big lives with big life experience. So it's an opportunity for us to be the kind of people that grow in empathy by doing whatever it takes to learn what other people are like. Number one is to receive the love that Jesus has for us. Number two is to do the work to grow in empathy. And number three is this. It's to see the Imago Dei. It's simply a theological term for the image of God. The image of of God. See the image of God. Every person, even you, every person has been created by and in the image of God. Every single person. You think of the most difficult person in your life, your worst enemy. Yes, that's right. They have been created in the image of God. It is too easy for us to miss this powerful truth. Every person, every person has been created in the image of God. And God loves that person. God loves everything he created. He said it is good. And he has got a special purpose for everybody. And nobody is in your world. Let me just say this. Nobody is in your world by mistake, not your parents. You, were, you weren't a mistake when you were born and you haven't got the wrong parents. Your parents... They're not, they're not in your world by accident. Your boss is not there by mistake. The siblings you have have been appointed into your family by God. Your co-workers are there because God intends to use them and you to do something in and through you in that place. Your employees, if you're a boss, boss or that barista that gets your order wrong every single week, they're in your world for a reason. What's God doing through all of these people that are difficult to love? Because when we see every single person through the eyes of God, that they have been created by him, that they are image bearers, image bearers of the creator, of the universe. Something must shift in our heart toward them. If we love God, we love his creation. You know, when your kids come home from school with that clay model that they've made in their art class and they tell you, look, Dad, I've made you this coffee cup. You can have your coffee in this tomorrow. And you know you'll get poisoned <laughs> if you drink out of that half-baked clay cup that they brought home from school. But in the morning, you make a coffee and you spin the barrel. You play roulette. 
with your life. <laughs> and you drink the coffee and count to ten. And if you're still alive, you tell them, that was the nicest coffee I've ever had. Why? Because we love the one who created it. You and all your enemies and all those difficult people in your world have been handcrafted by the master and are in your world on purpose. I wonder how we respond to those people that God puts in front of us. Finally, finally, I told you today that I was going to... Oh, let's, let's just do... Let's skip that. Let's just go finally to this final thought. Time is up. Finally. I've talked about how we can love the unlovable. I said I'd, I'd let us know how we do that. We can do that by letting Jesus in, letting his love affect us in a way that we can only respond with love for others. Grow in empathy so we can understand the lives of others and not live in a small, narrow world. And also, Imago Dei. See God in others. But I also said that I would show us how we can be more lovable. How can I be a more lovable person? Let's make it easier for everybody else in the world. Well, the big answer to that question, my final point is this, and it does both. It helps us to love others and it helps us to be more lovable. Number four, repent and forgive. Repent and forgive. Repent and forgive. If you want to be easier to love and be more lovable, repent and and forgive. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 9, it says this. Love prospers when a fault is forgiven, but dwelling on it separates close friends. You could also say dwelling on it makes you harder to love. You know, your willingness to forgive, your willingness to forgive, opens up opportunities for those friendships to grow or even be restored if they've been broken. And love prospers when a fault is forgiven. You know, for you to simply be a person that forgives, you're going to be a whole lot easier to love. And you're going to find it so much easier to love others. And you can also firstly repent to God for not loving Him as we should. And the truth is, there's many days where we don't really do all the things that we know God's called us to do. We don't really respond in the way that we know we should. And God moves upon our heart and calls us to step into what he's got for our life. To forgive others, to take the higher ground, to be generous, be courageous. We sometimes just say, I'm not sure. And we really are saying no to God. And maybe we need to repent and say to God, look, I'm sorry for trying to do it my way. I want to do it yours today. And then we can do the same for others. We can apologise to them, repent and say, God, I'm sorry for those whom I have not loved as you loved. You know, that's what Jesus said, didn't he? He said in Mark chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount, come on, it's about growing up. It's about growing up. Today we can mature a little in our heart, have an all-hearted approach to all people, even the unlovable even the enemies in our life, even difficult people. And we're going to pray a prayer right now. And as we do pray this prayer, it's going to, if you haven't before, it's going to invite Jesus into your life. But I've changed it up a little bit this morning. And for those online or listening later, I want this to be a holy moment for us, for those of us who want to really take this particular number point four on board and repent and forgive. Because I reckon... And how do I know this? I've grown in empathy and I know that I'm like this as well, that there are things in my life today that I need to repent of and just say sorry to God for. And as we do this, I'm just going to get the keys up as we do this. And also we are going to forgive because I know in my life that there are things that I need to let go, that I need to say, I'm going to forgive that person for that mistake or that person for that word or that person for that action or that person for that uh, mistreatment. Come on, there's some forgiveness that can happen in this room today. So as I, as I pray this prayer, I'm going to invite you to pray it after me. But just underneath that prayer, in your heart, you're just, you're just repenting, saying, sorry, God, and I'm apologizing to those other people right now. 
and I'm forgiving as well. I'm just letting those things go. And I'm, I'm just sensing now that in this, in this room that God will do some work in your heart to change something and to set you free from something that you've been battling for some time. You know, harboring grudges and unforgiveness, it locks up the love that's meant to be flowing through your heart. And today, I just get a sense that God wants to break the damn walls and let the water flow and let freedom find you in this moment. And, you know, if you feel like you're overwhelmed and you just want to let the real water flow and cry about that, that's fine. That's a safe place. You know, God wants to do some work as we invite the Holy Spirit to minister in this moment. So come on, why don't we just pray this prayer together after me. Jesus, this is my decision. You know, it is your decision too, church. You know, this isn't forced upon you. This is your decision. Today, I say yes to you. You died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. I invite you to be my saviour. Now, this next bit is powerful if you really mean it. You're going to say something in a moment that is, is, a, is, is massively powerful in terms of what, what happens in your heart. It's an invitation. You're about, to, you're about to invite Jesus to do something only he can do. So just repeat after me. Come into my life. Forgive my sin. Oh God, we are so sorry. Forgive me for not loving you with my whole heart. Forgive me for not loving others with my whole heart. You know what, church? There's only one way that you can move from this moment and know that you are empowered to do all that God's called you to do, and that is with His Holy Spirit at work in you. So we're going to pray finally one more line of this prayer. And as we do, I'm just... I'm just sensing in this moment it's going to just shift something in your spirit and it's going to bring joy to your life. It's going to remind you that it's not all about you. You haven't got to have all the answers, but you just need to invite one person into your heart to do the work with you. So come on after me. Why don't you say this? Fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thanks, church.